far. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for the latest in our Bridge Culture Club series. My name is Amber DeLind, and today we are discussing the 2022 documentary film, Bad Acts. This event is hosted by Bridge Michigan. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Amber DeLind. I'm the Membership and Engagement Director at Bridge. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jackie Garrett, who is our Fund Development Associate, and together we'll be leading today's conversation. Thank you to the many Bridge readers who have joined us today. In case you aren't familiar with us or are pretty new to Bridge Michigan, Bridge Michigan is Michigan's nonprofit, nonpartisan news source covering issues that matter to you and your community. If you don't already, you can subscribe for free at bridgemi.com. Also, those who are current Bridge Club members or people who have donated to Bridge Michigan any time over the last year get a number of benefits, including access to free electronic copies of each Bridge Culture Club selection, like today's film. You can become a member today by visiting a link we will drop into the chat in just a moment. And thank you to the many Bridge Club members who I see on our screen. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by Director David Siv. I will give you a full introduction to him momentarily, but we are incredibly honored that he was willing to join us for a discussion of his film, which I won't even pretend to be unbiased. I, I loved unequivocally. I thought it was really beautiful and I'm very excited that he's here to talk with us about it. David is traveling in the moment. He's in a car, so we, he will be video off, but we'll have lots of good conversation with him. The schedule for today's discussion goes like this. I'm going to do a quick introduction of David. I will lead a discussion with him about the film for approximately 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll switch to your questions. So if you have questions about Bad X or just questions generally for David, please type them into the chat today at any time, but please also remember to stay muted throughout today's discussion unless you are one of our speakers. We're not going to take uh, question, live questions, we're gonna take them via the chat. We will conclude this discussion by 1 p.m. As you heard at the beginning of the conversation, we are recording this discussion and we'll be posting the recording on Bridge's website, www.bridgemi.com later this week. And now without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to our special guest, David Siv. David Siv is a filmmaker, photographer, and songwriter. Following graduation from the University of Michigan, David moved from his rural hometown in Bad X, Michigan to Los Angeles. After working on a number of television shows, David eventually landed at Jeff Tremaine's production company, Gorilla Flicks, which would be his home for the years ahead. During his time mentoring under Tremaine, David would go on to produce and shoot a number of commercials, TV shows, and films for Gorilla Flicks, including Netflix's The Dirt and Bad Trip. David made his directorial debut in 2018 with his award-winning short film, Year Zero. The film has won Best Short Award Best Short Awards at the DC Asian American Pacific Film Festival, Vancouver Asian Film Festival, Manhattan International Film Festival, and Hell's Half Mile Film Festival. David's latest film, Bad Axe, won the Audience Award and Special Jury Recognition for Exceptional Intimacy and Storytelling in the Documentary Feature Competition at South by Southwest and made the shortlist for the Oscars Best Documentary Feature. We are so delighted to have David here today. David, welcome and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Happy to be here. We are, we're honored. Um, we, this is one of our, part of a bi-monthly series of events that we do, always focusing on some piece of media, oftentimes a book, this is our first film, um, that has a Michigan connection. And of course, that X fit that bill um, in it, but we have received copious amounts of feedback from readers. Bridge Michigan readers telling us how much they really enjoyed this film um, and thanking us for, for making uh, making it the selection. So thank you for making it and thank you for making the time. Oh, to talk about thank it. you. Of course. All right. So just to get us started, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you chose to make that act? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I Bad Axe was just saying is a very personal story, obviously. And um you know prior to the pandemic i i always knew i wanted to share my family's story um but i, I just never expected it would come together in the form of, of a documentary um so at the start of the pandemic you know my my wife and i we moved back home from new york to be in michigan and 
it really just started off as these home videos and just wanting to capture the special moment in time. Um, and then it eventually turned into something, you know, much bigger. And, and before we knew it, we had, a, had an entire documentary film. That's so incredible that it just sort of came, kind of became a bit of a spontaneous adventure. If you're willing, would, would you tell us a little bit about sort of your process and your timeline and how you were able to pull all of this together during the sort of peak of COVID? Like, how did you know that this was going to become a film? You know, it, I, I think the moment I realized it was going to become a film was uh, shortly after the Black Lives Matter movement happened. And, you know, you see that's when the restaurant started getting, you know, all this backlash and, and people, um, you know, they weren't too happy that our, our family was supporting this, this social movement. And it it was sort of just a reminder of this feeling of otherness. I think, you know, my siblings and I had always felt growing up in bad acts that look, if you, if you don't agree with our views or, you know, then you're not welcomed here. And, and I think that was a moment I, I realized I had a film, but, you know, the filmmaking process, it was interesting because it was, it, it was something that, you know, um, everything was unfolding in real time. And with documentary filmmaking, it's so, unpredictable with you know what your endings are going to be or what's going to even happen and you know especially when you're filming it during uh the pandemic so um we were editing the film as as we were shooting it um and you know we, we you didn't know what was going to happen day to day week to week um so before we knew it once we once we actually began editing we realized that we had an entire entire feature it's so interesting. I, I'm curious, this is, of course, as we heard in your biography, not your first film. How was, in what ways was it different? And maybe in what ways was it the same um, directing a film that you're sort of a character in, you know, that you were part of? Yeah, for, you know, it, being part of the film wasn't something I, I think I ever really anticipated at all i mean it, it it became clear that i needed to be a character in this story when you know we started editing and we realized that was something that felt like it was missing from the edit and uh it, that missing piece was was actually myself in a weird way and um you know it's it, and so it was it, it was a process to you know to really figure that out because what what I realized what was missing from myself being in the edit was this sense of intention of as far as like why is this story being told and once we started playing in the edit and started including more of the voice behind the camera um it it, it just started to work and it, it felt like there was a, a clear intention as to why this story was was being told so that was something that was, you know, I'd never had experience before in making a film because um, it's it's not often that, you know, the director finds himself being the one who is telling the story in like this specific way. I, I can't imagine it. It just was so interesting to see. And I, I it's fascinating to, for me to hear that you sort of discovered it in the edit that you needed to sort of be a, be present um, as part of, as sort of a character in the film. Um, I, I was sort of taking notes and, and questions I wanted to ask you as I went through the film. So these questions are a bit chronological. Um, at the very beginning of the film, it's just so obvious to see, I mean, from the beginning, but really throughout, um, it's so obvious to see the love that your family has for one another. At the beginning when, you know, it, Restaurant workers are are essential, and and uh, um, we're sort of uh, allowed to um, we're deemed essential, and we're allowed to be open at the beginning of the pandemic for takeout. Did you feel concerned for your for the your parents' health, and how how were you all grappling with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there was definitely I think that fear that um, that many, I think, you know, young adults or people who were living with, you know, older parents had. And, and that was, you know, we were no exception to that. And you, you kind of see that in the film, you know, of how, of how we try to grapple with the pandemic, just, just like how any, anybody else was grappling with it. And, you know, you pile on top of that, 
trying to keep a, a restaurant open and trying to run a business and um and it, it's tough and, and you you just see this struggle of our family trying to navigate the early days of the pandemic with you know the the fear of the virus and the fear of you know our our business being jeopardized and um and i think that's in some ways what makes the film relatable in some sense was that the pandemic was something we all had to we all were had to grapple with or learn to grapple with i agree i one of the it's interesting so we have a bridge culture club has a, a facebook group where we discuss you know amongst ourselves what whatever we could we consumed for this month's uh, version of culture club and so one of the questions that i posed there was whether the sort of those themes of the very beginning you know march and april 2020 were you know brought back any memories and there was a pretty robust conversation in the group about just some of the things that we'd almost forgotten about but that were so frightening at the, that beginning time when everything was so unknown i mean i have memories of of bleaching my groceries in the driveway of my house. I mean, it's just, it was really a, a, a scary time, particularly scary when you're in such a public facing um, business and it's, it's scary for livelihood, it's scary for safety. So thank you for being willing to, right. to share your experience in that. Um, much of the film really focused on your dad's experience, um, it, you know, as as a business owner, um, his experience in living through Cambodia's killing fields. And I just was curious, we can dig into this as much or as little as you like, um, just how you think his experience sort of shaped his worldview and reaction to the pandemic and how we see that in the film. Yeah, I, I think, you know, looking back at my dad's background of uh, surviving the killing fields, you know, he, he's always coming from a place of survival. And that stems from, you know, being a 16 year old kid who, you know, during one of the worst atrocities in, in recent um, history, had the responsibility of keeping his five younger siblings and his mother alive. Um, and then making, making out of that alive and then, you know, coming to this country and going through everything he's gone through. and and now we've arrived at the pandemic, I think it brought back a lot of those memories and this survival instinct he had. And, you know, it may look like he is overreacting to some of what's going on around him, but, but that's why it was important to include the history of Cambodia and the history of his past to, you know, really inform the audience, like he's, he's coming at this with a completely different perspective, a completely different viewpoint as far as, you know, how do you keep your family alive? How do you keep your business alive uh, during a, a very uncertain time? Absolutely. Uh, another sort of member of your family that we see a lot of in the film is your sister, Jacqueline. Um, and I'm curious, sort of a similar question, but about her experience growing up as sort of the oldest daughter, um, of, of restaurants that we all know are an extremely, they can be a very risky business. The margins are very thin. And I'm sure when, you know, when things started out, I'm sure there were lots of struggles and tough times um, throughout her childhood. Do you, how do you think sort of her experience um, shaped her worldview and reaction to the pandemic? I think for Jacqueline, you know, she was someone that you, you learn in the film that this business, this family business, our restaurant was something she has invested, you know, not only so much of her time and, you know, working there every weekend and um, just devoting anything she can to helping the family business, but she's also, you know, invested her, her money in as well. And and so, you know, the restaurant, it's it, for her, there's just as much as a stake as you can imagine, like my parents. And, and I think that's why, you know, she, she just wants to hold on and do anything she can to keep the restaurant and the business going during this time. She, you know, Jacqueline's the one who even first came up with the concept or the idea of sushi night. And, and so, you know, I think you, you get a sense of this, these responsibilities and this role as, um the eldest sibling that you know is, is placed upon her and you're seeing how how she takes those responsibilities and how she navigates 
you know, this, this world of pan pandemic. Absolutely, thank you. Um, sort of getting into some of, more of the sort of the middle portion of the film. I, I just, I was so, it was very difficult to watch and, and obviously much more difficult to experience. I'm sure sort of the ignorance and, and racist treatment that your family received um, it, during, throughout the, you know, especially after the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, did sort of your experience um, during the pandemic and, and throughout sort of this, these last few years change the way you think about the community where you, grew, where you grew up in any way? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think for me, it's, it, it's, it's been sort of this healing process and, uh, you know, you, there's that point in the film where I say this is a, a love letter to bad acts and, you know, I don't know if I exactly met that when uh, my dad is, is kind of pressing me and, and I kind of just say it in the moment, but um, I think by the end of the film and even now, I, I do very much stand behind that and feel like it's, it is a love letter to Bad Axe because, you know, Bad Axe is, it's an imperfect place, just like, so, you know, just how America is, but it's something you never stop fighting for. And there is a certain conditional love that I do have for it. Um, so I, I do feel closer to the community and, um, you know, inspired to keep pushing for, for it to, to be better every day that I get to, you know, be in Bad Axe. And I'm grateful that this film has, you know, sort of has allowed for that healing process to, to happen and take place, you know, not, not only for myself, but I think for the rest of my family and, and other members of the community too. Thank you. I feel like it, I'm sure it has to have a lot of complex emotions. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm curious. Uh, so as a director, obviously you had access to private conversations between family members while filming. How did you negotiate with them? How did it feel, you know, both as a director and as a member of your family? I, it, I mean, it's, you know, there are a lot of moments that are intimate and that are raw and, um, and I, I wanted to be, you know, as respectful for my family as I as I possibly could. So I actually did keep them involved in the in the editing process. I, I was collaborative with them and um, wanted them to understand why all of these, you know, moments that they might have not been proud of in the moment uh, when they were actually happening, like why why they were significant to include in the film. And you know, I think it ultimately just came down to you know, wanting to portray us as the imperfect three-dimensional people that we are. And when, you know, when you're trying to talk about all the themes that are represented in the film, um, I didn't want it to come across as, oh, we're preachy and we're these great people because that's not necessarily true. We, we try to be, but, but we're just like anyone else who we have our family struggles. We have, um, our own history and our baggage that we have to, that we, you know, continue to fight through every single day while also going through everything that was happening that year. Um, for me, it, it, and I think the rest of the family, you know, it, it became realized that it, it, it's important to show these tough moments because they're, you know, if we're going through them, then there's certainly other families that are as well. Absolutely. I think that was, it was just, it really did, I think what you described there, it made all of you feel to the viewer, at least to me, like real people who are really, you know, who are complex and who ha have many motivations. And, you know, and it just, for me, it really rounded out the film to have that sort of perspective that isn't just, you know, just at, at the restaurant or, you know, just talking about a specific issue. Um, so for me, it really, it really sort of made, made us understand um, the sort of the, the messages of the film even more. Um, I'm curious about how did your family members react to seeing the, the final cut of the film for the first time? They, you know, they were, it was a very emotional moment and, and we were all um, very, very moved when we sat down and, and watched the film together for the first time. Um, uh, and, and, you know, they, they continued to watch the film afterward because, you know, once you have one cut done, 
doesn't mean you're even close to being done. So they continue to watch the film throughout the process. And, um, and I think the, the really moving, you know, the most moving screen for us was, was probably at our world premiere when it was our first time showing it to, to an audience that had no idea who we were and, and seeing how connected these strangers were to our story. Um, I think that's when we realized like, oh, wow. Okay. Like this, this is something that, you know, it's obviously very personal to us, but um, it is resonating on this universal level. Absolutely. Could I ask you a little more about that? I'm curious about sort of as you've screened now across the country, across the world, um, you know, how have audiences in different places reacted to the film, you know, specifically in Bad X or in Michigan or across America? What has been the reaction? The, the reaction for, for the most part has just been extremely positive. And um, I, I remember when, uh, you know, we showed the film in Bad X for the first time. I, I think there was a lot of a lot of anxieties as far as, you know, how is the community going to react to it? Because, you know, you've seen the film, it becomes this this controversial topic. And, you know, some people aren't happy that the film is being made. and um, and so it, it felt like the real the real test was how is the community of, of bad acts going to respond to seeing our story on the screen for the first time? Um, and, and to our genuine surprise, you know, I remember when the film, it, it, this was this past November, um, the, the um, and I, I wanted to make it special that that first opening weekend. Um, and so I decided to show up and kind of just do the informal Q&A and a discussion. And at every one of the screenings, there were always people who, the skeptical people who, who would show up. And these were, you know, many of the same people that were kind of on social media. And um, they apologized for opening up their eyes to the that they, they didn't know existed in our country. Because um, um, I think at the time of release, there were people who were actually I'm glad to hear that there was um, that there were screenings of edits. I'm sure there were, but it's really interesting to hear the um, sort of the local reaction um, as well as reaction across the world. For a moment there, your audio was a little bit tough to hear, David. So, but hopefully at the end it was it was coming back in. So hopefully we'll be in good shape. Oh, um, I think I might have lost you. Let's see. Oh, I th we can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, I think I'm back now. Okay. There okay. Go. Very good. There you are. We the audio got a little tough to hear for a minute, so I wonder if the the signal just wasn't great for a moment. Um, so I'm one of the questions that many folks asked us um, in, in sort of our Facebook group going into this is how is business for Rachel now? You know, how did how did the film did it have any impact on business? Um, how are things going in June 2023? The, the restaurant is, is, is doing really well now. Um, uh, very grateful for, um, you know, as far as just the business being, you know, back to pretty pretty much most of what normal was prior to the pandemic. And, um, and especially since the film has been out, yeah, it's been really, really great to just see all of, you know, meet so many new people who are driving all across the state of Michigan who are coming just to, um, you know, enjoy a lunch at Rachel's or, or enjoy dinner and, and, and they're bringing other people who saw the film. So, so business has, has thankfully been really, really good. 
I'm so glad to hear that. Um, it, the, in sort of the, the coda of the film where we got to see sort of what everyone's doing now, we got, got to see some really good news from a lot of members of your family. Is, is your younger sister still, still running things at Rachel? She is, yep, yep. Raquel, Raquel is still, is, is really taking a step up and, and, um, it, it really, you know, manages the place, uh, you know, day to day. Jacqueline is still working there. Austin is still running the kitchen. Skylar's still there. So yeah, everyone's still there. So if, if you come on any given day, you know, you're bound to, you're bound to see one of us there. So I love it. Very cool. Um, I just have a couple more questions I'd like to ask you, and then I want to turn to some of the questions, really good questions we're seeing in the chat. Um, I'm just curious about sort of when you finished the film, you know, we talked a little bit about how sort of this was your love letter to Bad Axe, but do you, do you feel the messages in the film is, are the, the messages, the themes, et cetera, are they specific to Bad Axe or Michigan? Or are they really a bit more universal? What was your aim? Um, I, I think they're definitely more uh, universal. Um, and, and I say that you know, because I, I think there is something for everyone in this film. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to be uh, an AAPI Latinx family living in the middle of nowhere to understand um, everything that is in the film because the, the pandemic was something that, that we all went through. And, you know, it's, and then I think that's, you know, where it, it goes beyond, you know, your political beliefs or, or whatever they may be and see that you're just seeing this human experience of, of this family going through this uncertain time. And I, I think that's, that in a sense, you know, makes it um, a, a universal story. It's just this American story, uh, story of the American dream at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting as, as you begin to tell a story and make it more personal, it, it kind of just unfolds itself in a more universal way. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, I know that this is a question I had and also one that I see in the chat. Um, everyone wants to know, what are you working on next and where can we look for your work? Yeah, I, um, I'm currently developing a, a couple um, other documentaries with who right now and um, still, still in the early phases. I've, I've also been writing a uh, feature script that actually is based on my dad's entire journey of, of surviving the killing fields and, and coming to this country. Um, so always, always working, always developing new projects. Um, but you know, fil the filmmaking process it, it's it's not a short one. You know, usually films take between two and, and four years to complete. Um, but I, I'm excited just to throw my heart into whatever project is, is next and, uh, and see where it goes. Very cool. Well, I, I haven't imagined that at, at the very least there are uh, 72 people on this, uh, on this event who will be wait, waiting uh, for whatever comes next and we'll be watching. So um, now if it's all right, I'd like to turn to some of our reader submitted questions. So Beth asked, um, when she finished watching the film, she was left wanting to know more about your mother and her journey. Was it a conscious choice to focus on your dad's journey specifically in this film? Um, it, We're not getting your audio, David. David, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Let's see. Um, there you are. Now we can hear you. How about now? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. I I tried to turn my video on since I'm finally sitting down, but but maybe I'll just keep it off. Um, okay. No. So I I I've I've uh, was picking up um, my my uncle from the airport. He's coming from Cambodia with his daughter for the first. Uh, so oh my gosh, how exciting. <laughs> yeah 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 so I, I now that I'm sitting in the car I try to turn the video on um uh but yeah as far as the decision to focus 
it's more on my dad's sort of, and you know, versus my mom. Um, my dad's stories have always just felt a bit closer and um, more tangible to relate to in a way because he, you know, he's so young and he's he's shared these stories with me for a long time, and um, and so I feel closer to them in some ways, and and I think you'd say closer to my Cambodian roots, but you know, there is this other half of me that is Mexican and and all this family history that I honestly don't know so too much about. And, um, and, you know, part of that has to do with, you know, my grandparents on my mom's side, um, they, they were always hesitant to uh, pass down the Spanish language to her. And, you know, with that comes, you know, the loss of just some tradition and, and some stories and that, that don't get passed down. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that's the journey I'd, I'd like to explore one day. But, but yeah, my, my dad's story, they just feel closer to me in this way that they're stories I'm familiar with and, and I've always heard growing up, whereas, you know, the ones about more of my Mexican side, I, I, I still have yet to learn more about that, the other half of me. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you filling us in on that. Um, Karen was curious. We talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious about this too. She asked, um, I'm curious if since the film and the ease of the COVID-19 restrictions, has there generally been an increase in customers at Rachel? She said she personally cannot wait to take a trip to dine at Rachel. Oh, that's amazing. Um, we, we look forward to welcoming you. Um, yeah, it, uh, like I said, I, th I, I think business has is, is, is pretty much uh, gone back to, to where it was prior to the pandemic, if not even even better that that might be a question more for my my family um yeah. but it, it seems like you know as far as when i'm there it seems like they're they're always really busy so uh really grateful for that absolutely that's awesome um jackie was curious about she said i was so interested in the people who came to the restaurant during the pandemic and refused to wear masks sort of pretending not to understand that they were being told to wear masks and then not leaving she wondered if your family had later she said hopefully positive interactions with those people or was that kind of a someone coming in one time to sort of cause some mayhem that's it was definitely the the latter part um i we haven't heard from them or have seen them um since then and um then you know obviously that's that's their choice and, and their decision but no we we have not interacted with them since that evening okay okay um also, let's see here, you, you touched on this a moment ago when you were talking about your mom, um, but Janet was curious about, you know, when you talk, when, when your dad was talking about his, his experience growing up in Cambodia at, to the camera, did you know all of what he shared with you or was any of that new sort of information about the, the trauma that he experienced? were never really new but i think talking about the trauma and how those stories have had shaped just his own perspective i think that was something that was very new um mm -hmm. to me and, and to the rest of my family because it's one thing to share you know all of these stories it's another thing to talk about how those stories have have shaped who you are and how you think and what comes along with with you know, the su surviving these stories. Um, so that that honestly was was uh, very new to me and, and to the rest of my family to hear my dad talk about uh, his mental health in, in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, I just, it was a very, you know, eye-opening and, and it felt very personal. So it, we really, as a viewer, I know I appreciated his willingness to share that and for you to share it with us. Um, because it's, I'm sure it was not difficult or not easy to to hear and for him to to sort of talk about. Um, speaking of your dad, a much lighter topic. Um, I'm curious about whether his song from the end of the movie, which I really love seeing him perform, is that on Spotify or anywhere that we can find it? That that version is is not. Um, I we we get asked that quite a bit. Is where can we find that version? Hope Hopefully one day we can like put out the physical DVD and, and put it as a DVD extras. But um, the name of the song is is called Chop the Bottom Bong. Um, it's it's by this uh, very 
a famous Cambodian rock artist called uh, Simsis Mood. Uh, so that song is available on Spotify. If, if, if you look up Cambodian uh, like music, uh, it's, it's one of the more famous Cambodian songs, but, but yeah, it's called Champam Batambang and Batambang is where my grandmother was born. Oh, very cool. Well, that was um, that was the cherry on top of the movie for me. That was a very fun way, oh. way to end the film. Um, yeah, it looks like we've we've gotten through many of our audience questions. Are there any things that you want the folks from who read Bridge Michigan to know? Anything you want to leave us with before we let you get on with your day? Um, no, I, I'm just I'm I'm very grateful that that y'all decided to to watch Bad X and enjoying this discussion and um and i look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at the restaurant absolutely we um i when i first told my my husband about this a film that we had chosen it he's like oh i just went there he does he's an engineering consultant he had just done oh, some work that okay, he's okay. like their food is so good and i was like well then i guess i gotta join you next time so <laughs> um we are so grateful for for your time today um, and for working us into your schedule. I'm very excited that you have family here in town now. Um, thank you again. And we look forward to talking with you again soon, I hope. And we'll be looking for your next film whenever it arrives. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care and take care, Bridge readers. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye now.